Okay, this week we are in Ephesians chapter 6, the final week for our expository study. And uh, we're going to start out here, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Okay, so you see there a command for children to obey their parents and to honor their parents. But notice there's a special little clause there in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now that has two applications to it. First of all, are they saved? I know there are a lot of young people here on YouTube. If you're, you're teenagers and things like that, your parents aren't saved. They're lost. They're not in the Lord. So you have to be very careful as far as the thing of obedience to them as parents. You, there are certain things that, yes, you can obey. You obey the rules of their home and whatever, as long as it's in line with Scripture. As long as they're not telling you to do things that are contrary to the Word of God, then obey that. But when they're telling you to do things that are worldly, that things that lost people do and whatever else, you have a responsibility not to obey them. Okay? So are they in the Lord? Are they saved? Secondly, the second application of that is obey your parents in the Lord. In other words, what is right before God? You might have saved parents that are more carnal or more, they're not Bible believing as far as King James Bible believers. They might be struggling with new versions and struggling with Babel buildings and whatever else. Christians go through a time, a journey there where they'll, a lot of times they get saved and they get kind of mixed up in the world and they keep, the Lord eventually leads them out of that stuff. I understand that. But as a child there, and I'm assuming, you know, young teen up through older teens till the, till the time when you leave your home there, you would fall under the description of children uh, in the parent's home. You have to weigh things out with, can I obey my parents in this matter? Will it cause me to be in contradiction with the Word of God? I'll give you a couple examples here. Um, your parents say, hey, it's family movie night. Come on down. You walk down you say, uh, what exactly did you have in mind here? Oh, we got this neat movie. It's a Walt Disney movie. Well, uh, I'm not really into Walt Disney, to be very honest with you. Come on. Look, we want to do this thing as a family. You have to sit down and watch this. Or, you know, worse yet, it's a rated R movie or PG-13 or whatever. You know, we, we're going to do this as a family, okay? We need to do this as a family. Do you obey them? No. You say, well, then... Wouldn't that cause me to be in contradiction? Wouldn't that cause me to disobey this scripture? Look at verse 2. Honor thy father and mother. Did you know sometimes your disobedience can actually be bring honor to your father and mother? Say, well, what are you talking about? Okay, let's go back to the movie thing. You tell them, I'm not, I don't want to watch this movie, but instead could we could we read the Bible? Could I tell you what the Bible says? Could we look at an old photo album? Could we do something that's not going to cause me to be in sin with my beliefs before the Lord? Uh, Dad, Mom, hey, why don't instead of watching this movie, why don't you tell me what it was like when you were young? Tell me about my ancestors. Tell me about my family, my history. Grandma and Grandpa, what was it like when you were little? Disobeying a command of them that is ungodly, but yet bringing honor to them as a result. I'll give you another example. You come down to eat and they say, we're going to have TV dinners. We microwave them in these plastic containers. You look at that and you go, whoa, okay. BPA and the plastic and, and the processed food and whatever else there. Um, I'd rather not eat that. That's very toxic. What are you talking about? Tell you what, could I cook something? Or could I do something? Could I, could I help with, could, could we make a better meal than this? Dad, Mom, this stuff's bad for you. See, so you disobeyed them, but yet you're honoring them. A lot of different things that you could do like that. Um, if, they're, if they're saved, and you come down, and it's like, hey, we're going to have a family devotions here. And your dad picks up an NIV, and he's going to read it. You say, I'm not going to listen, Dad, if you're going to read out that NIV. What? We're going to have family devotions. Dad, the NIV is wrong. It's corrupt. You're going to bring a false spirit into this house. Why don't we read out of the King James Bible? 
See? That brings honor to your parents, even though you have to disobey them to bring that honor to them. See? And, you know, if you heard my study on the thing of a Christian's responsibility to their family, uh, one of the things that will be held over you a lot of times, if you have lost relatives and things, I have, my in-laws are lost, and if you heard my story there, when they were here, they were here earlier this year, and uh, my mother-in-law used profanity in this home here, and that doesn't work in my home. And I said, you're not going to use that kind of language here. And she blew up and it turned into a big thing, and, and they left. They left early. And I did not kick them out of the house. It was, she used profanity. And you know what she threw at me? You're not honoring us. Uh, well, I'm not your child. Okay? I'm 39 years old. I'm no longer a child. I'm a man, and this is my, I mean, ministry headquarters here. This is my home, and you're not going to come in here and do things that are contrary to my beliefs. It ain't going to happen. So if you have parents, you know, and I mean, I've seen this thing. I've had people, you know, in their 50s and 60s talk about their parents and saying, you're not honoring me, <laughs> you know, because they don't submit to them in everything or something like this. That doesn't work. What these verses are talking about here, as far as children, children obeying their parents, it's talking about children that are still you know, under the age of, of marriage and things and living at home and whatever. That's where that comes in at. But when you get older, you still have a responsibility to honor your father and mother, but you don't honor them by letting them continue in error. And just, oh, I'm just going to be quiet and stuff like that and let them use profanity here and let them use whatever and do whatever else here. That's not honor. Okay, so don't fall for that. But uh, let's continue here. Verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You say, well, how do I bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Turn back to Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Very well-known verse in the book of Proverbs. Very convicting for the fathers out there. Proverbs... 22. Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Okay? Don't, if you're, if you're a saved father and you have a son, um, the best thing that you can do is bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. How do you nurture something? If you have a plant someplace, how do you nurture it? By giving it water, right? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, talks about that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The word of God is likened to water, pure water. So you nurture and, ad and, and admonish a child by making sure that they're washed in the water of the word. That's very important there. But when you train the child up, when you're a father and you train your child to have a good, strong work ethic, I mean, the worst thing that you can do is let your child sit around watching television or playing video games or things like that. That's the worst thing that you can do. Okay? You train them to work. Teach them to work. Give them chores around the home. And you say, good, I'm just going to have a little slave then and I'm just never going to, they're never going to get time, free time to do anything. Well, then you're disobeying the verse there because it says, provoke not your children to wrath. You need to have some grace for your son or your daughter, your children there. You do need to have some grace for them. Okay? Again, remember what, you know, how you were when you were young, when you were their age. You know, and the, and the, the little pain that you were sometimes to your parents. You know? So you do need to have some grace on that. But you also need to be able to be fair and just with them. Yes, teach them the Bible. Absolutely. But don't make it a thing where it becomes this, you know, I, I've heard of, you know, people that they'll like, as a way of punishing a child, they'll, they'll make them sit down and pick a verse out of the Bible and then write it a hundred times or something like that. You know, that's not a good idea to use the Bible as punishment. Okay, you're going to have, end up provoking your child to wrath and they're going to end up growing up to hate the King James Bible. Okay. Now, does that mean that they aren't going to balk sometimes at, at, having to sit there and listen to devotions or whatever. Oh, sure, they're going to rebel against that somewhat, you know. But, you know, you got to get through that. And 
But the whole thing is you're to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Teach them to work. Teach them, but not too much work. See, moderation. Teach them to keep the room clean. Teach them to eat the right foods. Teach them whatever. That's bringing them up. Don't say, you will be a preacher when you grow up, and I'm going to make sure you do it. That's between them and God. God is the one that needs to call a preacher. Okay. Um, I was not brought up to be a preacher. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was given a very good work ethic. I was. Uh, we had a lot of chores growing up. Um, we had animals and things down through the years, chickens, and, and we had sheep for a little while. And, of course, we had uh, dogs. I never had cats growing up. My dad didn't like cats. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at times we'd go out and have to feed the dog, and we'd have to uh, back... I was raised in the country, so, you know, we, we burned our trash. We didn't really have a garbage disposal thing type of deal. So we'd burn anything that would burn, you know, and and uh, so you'd burn the trash. And I remember there were times I didn't want to burn the trash, and it was too bad it's, it's your week for it, you know. And, you know. <laughs> and there's, we had jobs to do. From the time I was old enough to, to hold a piece of wood, my dad had me out there and and uh, I was his uh, firewood holder while he was sawing, you know. And I remember when I'd pick up a, a sticks or logs or whatever, and we'd put them up on this sawhorse thing, and I'd I'd hold them down while he's over here with a chainsaw cutting it to length, and I'd move it forward and hold it down, and he'd cut it to length and move it forward and hold it down, and cut it to length. Doing firewood ever since I was a little boy, and um, working around our property was not a optional thing if I felt like it. It was required. It's the way it's supposed to be. But my dad didn't make it so bad and so horrible and terrible that I ended up growing up hating it. He didn't provoke me to wrath, you understand? Okay? That's what we need to do, you know, those out there that are fathers. You know, you need to not provoke your children to wrath. Very important. But uh, verse 5, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eyes service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord. Now look at this, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is their respective persons with him. Now the modern trick here is to say, see, this is, this is referring to you as a man and your employer. Whoever your employer is, you should do that there, not with eyes, you know, work for him, not with thy service as a man pleaser, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Verse 6 there, you know, and verse 7 and and you just kind of conveniently overlook the thing where it says bond or free. Um, no, the fact of the matter is that the King James Bible does teach slavery. It does not teach that every case of slavery has always been just and wonderful and good and that everybody should have slaves and things. It's not what the King James Bible teaches. It's just a historical reality that slavery was carried out for centuries, for thousands of years. Men have been slaves. Okay, you have a powerful country come in and overtake a smaller country. Oftentimes, it was a merciful thing that the men were turned into slaves. They were taken as slaves, bond servants. Okay, it wasn't this great moral evil that it's become. Okay, uh, it's just reality of history, people. You know, it's, this isn't some kind of a thing, oh, we should hate the King James Bible because it talks about slavery. It was a historical reality of the past. Just as simple as that. So, but that's what's going on there. First um, Timothy chapter 6. You can turn over here. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy 6 verses 1 and 2 says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke... Commit their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit these things teach and exhort. Okay, so there you see again the thing of a bond servant, a servant that is under the yoke. 
That's not the same thing as you being employed at such and such job, working for somebody. You're not under the yoke. You're not bond. All right. Yes, you have a responsibility there. Yes, you're an employee, but you can give your two weeks notice at any time and walk out the door. Or you just quit and walk out the door. Okay, so you're not under the yoke. Again, see, there are certain things in the Bible that are very embarrassing to the modern politically correct person. And you've got to get by that stuff as a Christian. And, you know, these things that are in here, again, it's not putting you down if you are black or African American or Afri of African type descent. This isn't putting you down. It's just, you know, saying reality here. All right? It's just the way things were in the past. So don't be ashamed of your King James Bible. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. Okay? It says here, And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, and this is, the, this is the part I want to focus on here. Neither is there respect of persons with him. You know the funny irony of everything? There's probably going to be slaves that are in heaven that have more rewards and a higher place in heaven. You know, we shall rule as kings and priests, you know, in the millennial kingdom, depending on how much you suffer down here. Wouldn't it be funny if there was slaves in heaven that are going to have greater rewards than the masters that own them? You might have a saved master and stuff like that that was in the past back there, you know, and and uh, and he had a bond servant, and I mean Abraham had bond servants. There were other people that had bond servants in the Bible, you know. It's not this horrible, great moral evil, you know. I mean, you treat, you know. I mean, think about this, folks. You you get your tribe taken over, and they take you, and you're going to be sold off, or you you know, either we'll sell you or we'll kill you. you know, I'd take being sold. And you go from living in some tribe someplace to living in a mansion, you know, and, and taking care of property and things like that. Caretaker of the property, essentially. You know, it wasn't always this horrible, terrible thing. All right. So, you know, again, history, the history books have really slanted people against what happened in the past. Slavery was not, you know, across the board. Yes, there were bad examples. Yes, of course there were. I'm sure that there were cases where you had white masters that were beating black servants and things and, and terrible things. And by the way, I actually have a book. Um, I don't have this in my study. I'm not even sure where the book is right now. But uh, uh, it should be right in this area. This is the. I'm not sure where it is. I should just... Well, it's back here somewhere. Sorry. But uh, Captain James Riley. Um, it was called Sufferings in Africa, I believe. And it was a he was a white British captain, and he was sold into slavery in Africa. Their ship... They were shipwrecked, and North African Arabs took them, and they sold them into slavery. So he was a white slave. So don't think, oh, it was just all the black people that were slaves and things. Slavery was carried out in all cultures, okay? That's not singling out a certain people according to their skin color and race, right? But uh, very interesting how the Lord does things. There's no respect of persons with Him. So, you know, no matter what your position in life, no matter what your uh, lowly state, you can still have greater rewards than those people who have been raised with a silver spoon in their mouth, as they say. You know, rich people. All right. Serve the Lord, and your rewards will come in eternity. Verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, that was very true in the first century, but today, we don't even need to worry about the wiles of the devil. There are no wiles of the devil out there. Everything is just good and calm and peaceful, and there's no attacks from Satan. So what are you talking about? I'm being sarcastic, brother. <laughs> you know, there's never been a time when it's more important to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, there's never been a po point in time when we need that strength that comes in the Lord. And by the way, strength comes through weakness. So you say, man, there's less and less of us. Good. Then that means we can be stronger now. 
you say, oh, you know, well, the moral majority is shrinking and the, and the conservative, you know, the conservative Christians presence in America is getting less and less and less. Good. Then those of us that are saved will shine that much brighter. Okay. I mean, if you turn a light on right now in this room, you know, I'll say it this way. I got my little flashlight here in my pocket yet, you know. I always carry a flashlight with me. You turn this flashlight on. Not very bright, is it? But it's on. But you certainly can't tell because there's a lot of light in the room. Now, if I shut all these other studio lights off and everything, that little light would be very, very bright. And you see, America for a long time had a very strong Christian, if you want to call it, you know, whatever you want to call that, Christian presence here in America. And it's getting darker and darker and darker and darker and darker, which means you shine brighter, Christian. That's good. That's a good thing. We can be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I mean, what better way to show the power of the Lord's might than to be able to show people the miracles that happen in your life and the things that God does for you when things are getting worse and worse and worse around you? But the Bible says there in verse 11 that we're to put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now we're going to get into this armor here. Verse 12 says here, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Question. When was the last time you saw a principality a power, a ruler of the darkness of this world, or spiritual wickedness in high places. When was the last time you saw any of the four of those groups physically manifested in front of you? I've never seen one. I've experienced some spiritual powers and things like that. I've, I've experienced spiritual, supernatural presence and things like that, demonic type activity. It's scary, I'll tell you that, but I've never seen it physically. What do I see? What do you see? Flesh and blood. He say, well, that's the problem then. Uh-uh. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. See? We're not wrestling the people down here on this earth. They're all lost souls going to hell. Those that are, that are, those that are lost, you know. Your worst, most, the most evil, wicked person out there can still get saved. They still have a soul that's redeemable. But you get this other group here, the, the principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this, this world and spiritual wickedness, they cannot get saved. Their doom is already fixed. And their goal, their design is to take as many people to hell with them. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. And so those principalities and all those powers and everything else, they're trying to damn as many people as they can. And unfortunately, they're going to be very, very successful the vast majority of people are going to hell. That's just what the Bible teaches. Okay? Very important to understand that. And it's kind of scary, too, because you can see flesh and blood, but you can't see these enemies. You know, I've often wondered about that. You know, you get these people, and they're doing the satanic salute and all this other stuff, and I think, are these guys actually part of this conspiracy with, in, tied in with the Masonic Lodge or the Illuminati or the Jesuits or whoever? Are they actually part of that? Or is it just a spirit leading them to do these things? You know, and some of that I don't know. You might have some people that, that are not actually connected in with occult groups. They're not actually getting marching orders from these occult groups. But there are spirits that are influencing them to make it look like they're lining up, they're lining up with those same goals kind of strange. And you say, well then, uh, how do we fight this thing? How do we fight in this battle? You know, that we get guns and, and everything and, and be fully armed and everything like that? No, because guns can only kill flesh and blood. Guns can't kill spiritual wickedness. Spiritual powers can't be killed with our weapons that we have. Our physical weapons, some devil manifests itself right here physically. And I pull out a gun and go, I could shoot every round in the gun into the thing and it wouldn't mean it, it wouldn't even hurt the thing. I could pull out a knife, I could grab this sword right here and I could say, you know, here, there's, there's a devil in front of me. Like that. Get him. 
I got him there. I got the devil. Uh, no, this isn't going to work. You say, what is going to work? The Word of God. You have a spiritual weapon. Let's read about that. Well, here, before we read about that, actually, let's go to verse uh, here in Daniel chapter 10. Talked about this in another study. But I'll just, I just want to go here quick again just to show this. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 through 14. To show you the application of some of this thing of the spiritual warfare that's going on all around us. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 says, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Hmm. So he's actually saying what will befall thy people in the latter days. It's going to be even worse with the fighting and spiritual powers and things like this. You have this angel fighting with these principalities, essentially. Huh. Pretty incredible. Jump down to uh, where are we at here? verse 20. Then said he, Knowest thou with, wherefore I come unto thee? And now I, will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. So he's actually saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to fight you know, with this spiritual power here, this principality or whatever it was there. Pretty incredible. Let's see how we are going to fight against this stuff. Okay? Ephesians, or, yeah, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 17. It says here, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. What do we read over in uh, chapter 5? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Are we living in the evil day? Yeah, absolutely. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. You know, tied in with here. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Hmm. Very interesting. You say, what is the sword of the Spirit? Well, here we have it, right there. Look at that thing. Look how powerful that thing is. This is a, this is a real one, too, by the way. This isn't one of these little show swords or whatever. This thing here is a real sword. You could, you know, chop things like crazy with this sword. This is an Italian uh, long sword, I think they called it. But uh, this is a very sharp sword, too. I'm not going to, you know, show you a while, you know, and touch it or whatever. But um, let's look at this sword here according to Scripture. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. Very intriguing passage here. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, <clears throat> and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hmm. Let me just stop there for a minute. Question. Can this sword right here divide asunder the joints and marrow? Yes. I could take this sword and hack your arm off. I mean, if I swung this thing at you really hard like that, you'd have your arm laying on the ground. Okay? The joints and marrow, yeah, I can divide asunder that with this. How about dividing asunder the soul and spirit with this? Not going to happen. That's spiritual. This thing can only touch your flesh. This thing can only mess with your flesh. All right? How about this other one? A discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Can I do that with this? No. 
Not really. But look at verse 13. This is where it gets even more interesting. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Huh? His sight? Can this sword see? Does it have eyes? No. What about this sword? The sword of the Spirit. According to that verse right there, it says, is not manifest in his sight. All things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You say, well, it's, 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 you know, it's talking about Jesus, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. That's not what the verse says. The Word of God, lowercase w, the written Word, is what's being talked about. And the Bible says that it can see. Hmm. Interesting, too, because the Bible says about that it's like light. You need light to go through a dark place. The days are evil. The world is dark. There's your light. We have a light saber, you know. <laughs> okay. Why do you think Hollywood's, you know, perverting this stuff, taking the stealing? They steal stuff from the Bible all the time. They do it frequently. But turn back to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to show you something interesting. You say, you know, there's a, all these different pieces of armor there, and, and only one of them is the Word of God. Well, that's partly true there. The Word of God is mentioned there in verse 17, which is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit there. But every piece of armor is tied back into this book. Let me look at this, or let's look at this. Your loins girt about with truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay? Having on the breastplate of righteousness. Where do you get your righteousness from? Right there. Not having mine own righteousness, but the, what the righteousness which is of faith, you know, by Christ. You learned about righteousness through this book. What about having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace? How do you know the gospel? From a book? The gospel of peace? Great peace have they which love thy law. And nothing shall offend them. Huh. Interesting. Above all, taking the shield of faith. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Ties back to the book. And take the helmet of salvation. How do you get saved? From the pages of the book. You see, it all ties back to the Bible. And you know, the Lord showed me that thing many years ago, and that's why I've dedicated my life to the preaching and teaching and the defense of this book. You see, just as the New World Order minions, the Illuminati, One World Government, New, you know, United Nations, whatever, whoever you want to make it into, Council on Foreign Relations, Masons, Jesuits, blah, blah, all those Satanists, they all want to take away weapons from the common man. So, too, the devil wants to take away the strongest weapon in the universe, the Word of God. He doesn't want you to have this book. This book is a living book. This is why it scares the enemy. And you know what? I've said it before and I'll say it again. I want to have this book around. I want to have this scriptures put on the walls, put around doors and things like this and all that. Why? It's powerful. This is a powerful book. I put scriptures on my truck. I try to have a Bible with me at all times. Why? It's powerful. You say, oh, come on, Brian. Are you trying to make us into some kind of a little special lucky charm that you have around you or something? Like that? No, no, it's not a lucky charm. It's a powerful book. And I want to have it with me. I mean, hey, you never know when you're going to need to witness to somebody. You never know when you're going to need to read the Bible or whatever. Carry it with you. Never unarmed, you see? Always make sure that you have that thing with you. I mean, you're holding, you're holding a book that contains the very words of the creator of the universe. Keep that in mind. Now let's look at uh, 
Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20. Okay, it says here, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance, utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. <laughs> That's convicting. Very, very convicting. And, uh, you know, I'm not in bonds, and I haven't been to prison or, or anything yet, you know, for preaching the gospel. And I'm hoping that I can, I don't have to go to jail or anything like that before the Lord takes us out of here. If, if it happens, it happens, but I pray that it doesn't. But uh, that's why I ask for your prayers a lot, because I want to be able to open my mouth boldly and speak boldly. Not to be offensive, not to be a jerk that people are going to end up hating me or something like that. No, it's just I want to be able to be bold for Jesus Christ to keep away this evil, to fight these principalities and powers and things like that. Okay? I hope I can do that. And by the way, you say, well, uh, what was going on back there with Daniel? This All this fighting and the spiritual powers and everything. Why was Daniel in Babylon? They were taken captive by the Babylonian government because they turned away from God as a nation. The nation of Israel turned their back on God and God said, okay, Babylonians, my servant Nebuchadnezzar, go on in there and punish him. And that's one of the reasons why America is falling as a nation. Because America, the Christians in America have turned their back on God. They've been falling into the idols of television and, and movies and covetousness and, and all sorts of other things. And therefore, God is saying, okay, I'm going to allow evil to happen. And the more things are tolerated, the more evil we're going to see. But let me just encourage you, because some of this, it's just like, you know, you feel like you're, you know, on a runaway train and, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't, it's going too fast. You can't jump off. And, and it's just like, we're just going to crash here. You feel that way sometimes. But let me just encourage you, as a Bible-believing Christian, Understand that Daniel was in captivity as a nation, and yet he thrived in that captivity. He had power because he understood the Word of God, and he lived by the Word of God. And as powerful as Nebuchadnezzar was, and I mean, his word was law, okay? He was the most powerful dictator probably that ever lived. And this man respected and actually bowed down and worshiped Daniel. And that was wrong. Daniel should have said, hey, get up, you know, whatever. That was that was a, a sin on Daniel's part. But the point is, Daniel thrived in that system because even though most of the Jewish people had forsaken the Lord, Daniel didn't. Along with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, those guys, they said, hey, we're not going to bow down. All the other people bowing down to the you know, the image there, the I think it was a big obelisk, if you, you know, study the thing out. They're all bowing down to it. These three guys say, we're not bound. Well, they're going to throw you in the in the fiery, you know, furnace there. Whatever. We're not bound. And look what happened. You know, they were given high positions in that system. So even if America gets more and more and more corrupt, you stick by the book. God can preserve you. God can protect you. You know, don't forget that. We all need to speak boldly in this time. As you see the evil getting worse and worse and hate crime laws and everything else, don't be cowed by that stuff. Don't be, don't become cowardly and, oh, I, I, I just, I, I shouldn't say this and I shouldn't do that and whatever else. Stand up against it. Fight. Now's not the time to retreat. Okay. Now's the time to fight harder. But go to verse 21 through 24. It says here, But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. And, um, 
you know, certainly it is a good thing to reprove and rebuke and, and you know, have exposés, and that's what I do a lot of and, and everything else. But uh, I really do try to, you know, talk about some good reports now and then. Um, I can tell you, brethren, just as a point of a way of encouraging you, uh, even though the world is getting worse, even though the things are, are waxing, evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, as the Bible says, even though the economy is getting worse, the um, environmental catastrophe is getting worse, there's a lot of things that are getting worse. I can tell you right now that that small remnant of Bible believers that you're a part of, um, we are seeing our numbers not only increase, but get stronger. And I'm seeing brothers and sisters in the Lord that, that have real, true victory in their life. And uh, we're, not, we're not defeated yet, okay? Um, and we won't be defeated, by the way. We're going to be leaving uh, this, this world uh, when the Lord takes us out of here. And I'm not saying we won't be persecuted before that happens. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is um, we are more than conquerors through the Lord Jesus Christ, through Him that loved us. Bible says, you know, we're, we've, we've already won is the whole thing. You know, uh, even if every Christian would be killed, which isn't going to happen because there's going to be those that are alive and remain and are called up living, you know, to be with the Lord. But even if every Christian in America gets killed uh, beforehand, we're still going to, you know, absent from the body, present with the Lord for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You know, we're going up and we're coming back in seven years to whip the Antichrist and, and this whole system that's that's being built and all the billions and trillions of dollars and this inflated fake currency and all this other stuff. Satan has been building this thing now for, you know, approximately 6,000 years, trying to build this whole huge kingdom. It takes 6,000 years to build something and it lasts for seven years and is destroyed. You know, what a success. <laughs> Satan is a failure. Satan is a loser. Okay. And the fact that there's a lot of people that are following him just proves that, you know, he's drawn in a lot of people. He doesn't want to go to hell alone is the whole thing. And if you're, I mean, if you're watching this stuff and you're not saved, you don't know for sure that you're saved, good night, man. What, what else is it going to take you to, you know, to convince you that you need to be saved? I mean, what in the world are you waiting for? You know, I mean... Well, I think I'd like to see the rapture happen and then I'd like to see the Antichrist and the events of Revelation, you know, coming in and stuff. I know a lot of you have been commenting about this, about this post-tribber stuff and just like, they're not going to make it. These people that think that they're going to go through, you know, the ones that, you know, if you're saved, you're leaving at the rapture. Sorry, even if you don't believe in the rapture, you're going. But those that are lost and easy believism or whatever, and they're like, oh, we're going to go through the tribulation. The ones that do, they... You know, post-tribbers somehow think that the, the time of Jacob's trouble is just going to be, it's bad, but not really that bad. Oh, man, it's going to be so horrible. It's going to be a nightmare having, you know, facing the wrath of Almighty God. You know, I mean, good night. And you say, well, it starts three and a half years into the thing. It starts at the beginning when the Lord opens up the first seal and the Antichrist is unleashed on the earth. All right? That's not God's happy, peaceful love there that's, that's his wrath. He's, he's just like, you know, he brought wrath upon the nation of Israel because they forsook him and said, Nebuchadnezzar, go on in there and get him. The Antichrist is going to be ten times worse. So that's going to be it for the study of the book of Ephesians. Well, there's just so much in that book. Just so amazing. But um, don't let anybody disarm you. I say that all the time in this in, in my videos, but man, I just I can't get that thing through enough. The book, the book, the book, the book, the book. This is the single most important possession you have. You know, and the more you know this book, the more you live by this book, the more you let this book look into your life, shine the light into the dark areas of your life, you know, the better you're off you're gonna be the stronger you're, you're going to be, the more protection you're going to have for your home, for your family. You need to know the book and don't let anybody ever take it from you. Anyone, anyone that comes after this Bible is your enemy. They might be saved, they might be a loved one or whatever else,
But if they're ignorantly, if they have been so ignorantly deceived that they are, you know, coming after the King James Bible, don't listen to them. Do not listen to them. Okay? So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, that, that uh, you've given us such a, a spiritually powerful book down here that, that uh, even the, most, the strongest uh, principality or power, um, they're, they're fearful, Lord, of this book. And they're fearful of a Christian that knows the book. And uh, I just thank you, Lord, that we can have that power through you and that you've just left us with this record that we have and Lord, I pray that as things get darker, that, that uh, those Bible-believing Christians out there, Lord, that they would just shine brighter and brighter all the time. And um, I just pray that you just keep us all in your word and uh, that you would take us out of here soon, Lord, so that we could have that blessed reunion. And I just pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. I'm going to be doing some more studies coming up here, uh, doing these uh, expository studies. Uh, they are very good to do, but um, a lot of times it's, it's, you know, I have a lot going here around the ministry headquarters I need to get done, and uh, so I do these expository studies. It's, it's not the same thing. I can kind of keep my mind focused more on chapter and this chapter and then the next chapter and the next one. You know, it's easier to stay focused on that than, than doing totally different subjects do the subject, you know, do a study on this, do a study on that, you know, doing all these different studies. Um, it's not as easy as, you know, making, you know, three or four right in a row, you know, like that. So uh, this has been a, a good time getting a lot of work done here at the ministry headquarters. And uh, so not sure when we're going to be doing another expository study. Uh, we'll be doing those periodically. But uh, there's just so many projects right now uh, that are coming up here. And uh, so we will keep fighting. And uh, just, I know it can get very, very, very discouraging at times just to see how evil things are becoming and just vexing. I mean, it's just, it, it gets more evil by the day now, by the hour almost. I mean, it's just like things are getting so bad. And I know it's it's tempting sometimes to just kind of say, you know, I'm just going to go into hiding or something like this, or I'm just going to, I don't even want to act like a Christian or look like a Christian or be identified as a Christian. Don't fall for that, brethren. Uh, now's the time when we need to shine brighter than ever. And, uh, you know, as we're seeing the Babel buildings collapsing and falling down, uh, and they are, and they will, um, you know, I, I talked to an older brother in the Lord years ago, and I've been saved a long time, and he said, I believe that the Bible is going to come full circle. I believe we're going to be right back to the first century practices, you know, at the rapture. And I agree. I think the true Christians are going to be worshiping apart from Babel buildings. Um, I really do believe that. I believe that now for years. And I'm seeing more and more persecution coming to the Babel buildings, and, and um, man... Cut the ties to that thing. It's so much more free and so much, I mean, you can do so much more for the Lord apart from these, you know, indebted buildings that God's never, God never told anybody to build one of them things. Give me a break. Based off pagan, you know, architecture and, you know, the whole thing. So, yoked up to the government as well. But, um, not sure what we're going to be doing next week yet, but, uh, Thank you to everybody that's, that uh, prays for the ministry. Thank you to all those who donate. Um, we just, I am so blessed. Uh, I just, of all the things I thought I'd be doing in my life, you know, you told me years ago that you're going to be a preacher and that there's going to be people from all over the world watching you. I'd have been like, huh? <laughs> you know, what? And I give God all the glory, all the credit. I, I can't take any credit for anything. I have no talent. I have, you know, I have no natural ability. It's just the Lord, you know, chooses to, to use this ministry, and, and I'm very humbled by that. And I'm humbled by the things that you uh, out there, my viewers have, have written to me and things. And 
it's just amazing. And I can tell you, you know, if God uses somebody like me, He can use anybody. I mean, it's just, um, don't be upset about the sins of your past. Get them, you know, forsake them. You know, get them forgiven. Confess to the Lord. You know, He'll forgive you. You can move forward. You know, just, just keep your mind on eternal things. You know, the Bible, keep that book the most prominent thing in your life. And uh, just become obsessed with the Word of God. And uh, He will help you to do tremendous things. And uh, that's, again, the reason why the Lord has used this ministry here is just because I'm obsessed with my subject. I just want to read the Word of God and have the Word of God around me and, and have a Bible with me and you know at all times. And, and just I'm obsessed with the King James Bible. And uh, people make fun of me for that, and people will make fun of you for it if you do that. And uh, that's perfectly all right. They were ashamed of, of Jesus, you know, back when He was here on the earth. They'll certainly be ashamed of the Word of God, the written Word of God. So, stay strong, brethren. Uh, we are winding down to the last closing minutes of this church age that we are in. Um, it's going to be soon that we're going to go to be with the Lord. And uh, even so, come Lord Jesus. Thank you for watching. We will see you next week.